Hello, Tony Z Voices viewers. This is David Plazas, the Opinion and Engagement Director for the USA Today Network Tennessee and the Tennessean. I have the immense pleasure of having Dr. James Hildreth, President of Meharry College, who is here as my guest today. Dr. Hildreth, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, David. Thank you. You know, I've been watching you for these past several weeks on the daily briefings uh, for Mayor Cooper, and uh, a term that you have uh, often used is don't be a vector. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us, what does that mean in the context of where we were and where we are today? So we've had three pandemics with coronaviruses since 2000. 2002, it was SARS. 2012, it was MERS. And now we have the COVID-19 virus. And in the first two pandemics, camels and cats were the animals that caused the virus to jump into humans. So they were the vectors for the virus to get it into humans. The big difference between those two pandemics and this one is that in this pandemic, humans are transferring it to humans. So we are the vector. So in the prior two pandemics, there were animal vectors, but in this pandemic, we are in fact the vectors. And that's why the social distancing and staying at home is gonna be effective in curbing the spread of the virus. No, thank you for that explanation. And I know that the mayor and Dr. Jahangir and yourself, you've been urging people to stay home and to take this seriously. And even with, a slowing of the spread of the virus, there's still a risk that it could uh, become intense again. Could you talk a little bit about that, please? Yes. Uh, well, the way that uh, these things work, there's a concept known as herd immunity. And that refers to the fact that when a certain percentage of people or animals in a population are resistant to a pathogen or a virus, it cannot spread because you might imagine that, say, if 90% of the people have immunity to coronavirus, the likelihood that somebody with the virus could spread it to another would be very, very low. But since there's only, there's less than a million people in the United States that have been infected, there are 340 million of us left who are not infected. That means the virus could easily spread because there's so limited immunity to it. So people need to know that flattening the curve is going to allow our healthcare systems to take care of those who are sick but there's still going to be a lot of opportunity for the virus to infect others because there's no, no level of immunity yet in the population. And that's where vaccines come in. Vaccines can confer herd immunity and keep the virus from spreading. Well, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, too, is that you've been very vocal with regard to issues of equity and reporting and respect. Uh, there was a story uh, earlier this week about um, Dr. Armin Henderson, uh, who's a Meharry graduate uh, in the Miami area, who was uh, detained, arrested uh, momentarily uh, because uh, it seems that the sheriff's deputy or the police officer thought that he was not doing what he was supposed to do. He was there trying to test homeless people. Can you talk about your thoughts and, and your reaction? Because it was a very strong tweet that you sent out. Well, I think that this pandemic is uncovering some uncomfortable things about where we are uh, as a nation. And clearly, this whole idea of white police officers targeting African-American men is something that's still kind of simmering in our society. And to have someone who is as well-trained, well-educated, and well-meaning as Dr. Henderson to be subjected to that, there's really no reason whatsoever that that should have happened. And I promise you, well, not promise you, I suspect that if he had been a white doctor doing the same thing, the, the result would have been something different. Um, and I find it really uh, disturbing that at this point in the history of our country, that if I'm not dressed a certain way, even when I'm out and about, the reaction I get is very different than when I'm in my role as president and wearing my uniform. So I'm just saying that, that I think the pandemic has uncovered some very uncomfortable things that hopefully we can deal with and move forward on. Uh, this whole thing of African-Americans being more subject to severe disease and dying from COVID-19 speaks to the fact that there's these health disparities, health inequities that have been in place for decades. Yeah. And all the virus is doing is, is demonstrating that in a very powerful way. So that's really what this is about for me. Yeah, and related to that, uh, you and, and on behalf of Meharry applauded uh, the decision by the Congressional Black Caucus and key members of Congress to support the Equitable Data Collection and Disclosure on COVID-19 Act. Would you talk a little bit about what that is and why you think it's important? Uh, when, when, you're, when you're dealing with a virus or any kind of pandemic, 
data is very important um, because we have limited resources and we want to direct those to where they're much where they're needed. And people have said we're fighting an invisible enemy, and that's that's actually true. So how do you make the invisible enemy visible? In this case, you test. We need we need preemptive and comprehensive testing of vulnerable populations. Uh, that includes prisons, nursing homes, assisted living facilities, and of course, minority communities. The reason for that is that if you have asthma, heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, if you get COVID-19, your chances of having a poor outcome and dying is much higher than the rest of the population. Since we know that, it would seem to me that to save as many lives as possible, we focus some resources on keeping the virus out of those communities. And you can't do that without data. For example, we need to identify the positives, do proper contact tracing, and we need to test all the contact quickly. So that's why the rapid test is so important. This won't work if you have to wait 10 days to get the results. You need the results almost immediately to know when you do the contact tracing, what your next step will, will be. So this bill that's been introduced would provide $250 billion, $250 million, I'm sorry, to set up a consortium of, of academic health sciences centers that would do this uh, testing preemptively, collect the data, and then help us distribute the public health workers where they need to be. So it's very important because you can't do the work without the data. And that's why this is so very important to give us the data we need to be most effective. And I'm very excited about it. Well, very good, thank you. And can you tell us a little bit about um, the medical students at Meharry? Uh, this is a unique challenge and opportunity for them. Um, how are they uh, engaged in this in this fight? So as you probably would imagine, we had to drastically change how we're teaching our students. Uh, the students that are in their earlier years in didactic courses, those are all now being done in a flipped classroom setting. In other words, the lectures are being videotaped and the students are watching the videos wherever they are at home in their, in their apartments. Um, for the clinical students, students in their clinical rotations, we've had to bring them back home, so to speak, until this is uh, dealt with. One of the issues with the students was we didn't want to take away from PPE from the health care professionals by having students present because there was just not enough equipment to keep them safe. So what our students are doing now, they're volunteering on the assessment center we've set up for COVID-19 testing. Uh, they're doing that at our site and at some of the other sites. Uh, we're also going to be doing some uh, phone banks to call people, to check on them, to see whether or not they have symptoms. We're trying to be preemptive in keeping people safe and, and uh, free from the virus, and our students are playing a big role in that. And it's, no, um, a, and it's a once in a, it might be a once in a lifetime opportunity for students to be part of something that's so much bigger than all of us. And they're excited about it. No, thank you to you and your students for doing that and for our healthcare professionals who are risking their lives in this. This is, uh, this is a tremendous thing. I know people are being asked to stay at home and for one of the things that has been exposed as well, aside from the public health inequities has been the technology inequities that those yeah. who can access technology can learn and those who can't have a, a tremendous disadvantage. Right, I think so. And uh, we, we have 800 employees at Meharry and most of them can work from home because we are now all working from home. But there are certain jobs you can't do from home, whether you have technology or not. So you have to come in. So we're trying to make sure that those individuals are safe. And then there are other individuals who we've had to give them laptops and other things so they can do this. But you're right. There's a technology gap that makes me very concerned about uh, unequal outcomes based on the technology differences that we have in our communities. And that's one of the reasons why we'd like to, in North Nashville especially, make sure we're reaching all of those who may not have the technology to do some of the things that others can do. Um, and that's part of our plan in terms of the, the comprehensive screening of the neighborhood. I wanted to turn for a moment to, to a different subject. How are you personally coping? I mean, you're, you're busy, you're, you're talking, you're, you're trying to save Nashville and, and the area, but what are you doing for self-care and, and, and for self-nourishment? So... Uh, I'm here 
at home with my wife of 40 years. So we were supporting each other as best we can, trying not to get on each other's nerves too much. Uh, I'm also uh, an avid gardener, so I've been spending a lot of time out back, uh, you know, digging in the dirt and moving my plants around. Uh, so that's very helpful. And occasionally I'll sneak a ride on my bike when I think there's not going to be very many people out. Um, and one of the things that I really worry about is uh, people who are living alone, who don't have, you know, someone to talk to or interact with. Those are the folks I'm most worried about because uh, it can be very stressful and people are worried or scared. And if you're alone and worried and scared, then that's a really bad position to be in. So I feel fortunate to have Phyllis here with me, uh, but I do worry about those individuals who are on their own, who now because of the COVID-19, their friends and loved ones can't reach out to them or hug them or you know, show them comfort. So it's, it's, it's a really important aspect of this whole thing. How do we keep people from being too stressed uh, and emotionally uh, damaged by this? Because that could actually happen. But for me, I'm, you know, I'm out in the garden. <laughs> I'm doing Zoom calls, numerous Zoom calls a day. Uh, and it's, it's hard. I mean, it's just hard. It really is. Because I, I like to interact with people. And, and not being able to do that has been a real challenge for me. Well, thank you for sharing that. And please give uh, Dr. Hildreth, Phyllis Hildreth, uh, my best as well. Sure. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to both of you. Um, you know, one of the things that has helped me get through this is just some, some great literature or poetry. Do you have any favorite authors that you go back to or new authors that you're looking at? Uh, I'm a real fan of Shakespeare. And, you know, I think I read all the plays at least once. But uh, I've been going back and reading some of my favorites. Uh, Henry V is one of them, and Macbeth, and a couple of others, so I've been doing that. I've also been reading some essays, uh, short stories and essays uh, in biology, which I find fascinating. So uh, I probably should read other things, but I'm fascinated by science and biology. <laughs> so I've been reading a lot of those books that have been piling up. Uh, and also doing a lot of the Sudoku or Sudoku, whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no, that, that, that's excellent. Those are great recommendations. I, and I know now has never been a, a better time to read about science. Uh, one of the concerns that I have as a journalist is the issue of misinformation. And I know yeah. scientists and doctors like yourself are really adamant about trying to get out this kind of information. And um, are there any myths that you have to address more frequently than others when it comes to, to this? Sure. Well, one of them that started early on was a notion that African Americans and people in Africa were somehow going to be resistant to to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, COVID-19, and that was totally, obviously, incorrect. Uh, viruses tend to be agnostic; they don't care if you're black, white, Asian, Hispanic. If you have the receptors they need to get into your body, they're going to infect you. Um, what What is clear, though, is that if you have these underlying conditions. Uh, as a group or as a population, you're going to do worse. So we've done our best to try to convince people that all of us need to take this seriously. You might remember in the early days of the HIV uh, pandemic when it was thought that only gay white men could be infected by the virus. It's the same sort of thing. So a huge effort was made to make sure people understood that everyone can be impacted by HIV. But we had to do the same thing for the COVID-19. So I think getting the facts out as quickly as possible can help us keep people safe. But it's a constant battle uh, that we have in a situation like this. Because uh, rumors get started and they take along a life of their own. Uh, people think they know what they're talking about when they really don't. Because uh, some people sound very convincing. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, but what they're saying is not rooted in science. And my role when the mayor's briefings is to try to make the science understandable to people to both lessen anxiety, but also to have people understand why we're doing what we're doing. And to, to the extent I'm able to do that, I think that's very helpful. 
Now, I think you've addressed one of the, the levels of anxiety, which is the mental health aspect uh, of uh, what people are going through. And then there's also the economic aspect, which is creating a lot of stress as well. Um, you know, that constant question of when are we going to reopen the economy? And it it feels like, at least from my conversations and reading, is that this we're not going to be the same as we were before this. And, and I just wanted to get your sense of that. No, I think uh, we're going to go back to a new normal. But that new normal will incorporate some of the things we're doing now to keep, our, to keep ourselves safe. The old normal, if we're going to have that, requires us to have a, a vaccine when all of us can feel we can interact and do what we do without worrying about getting infected. Um, so until we have a drug that effectively treats COVID-19 or a vaccine that prevents the virus from infecting us, our normal will be a new normal where social distancing in some respects will still have to be done. Uh, all those things we've learned about, the hand washing, sanitizing surfaces, all those things will need to continue. And depending on what kind of work you do, it might be a different approach to doing that work. But, but, but it definitely won't be the old normal of sitting in a theater with a 300 other people or something like that. That will come, but probably not for another 18 months to two years until we have a way to protect ourselves except from what we're doing now. You know, one of the toughest things, I'm a preacher's kid, so church has been part of my life for since I was a, a boy, and, and that's probably one of the toughest challenges for people. It's, I can't go to church, or I can't go to a congregation or synagogue or the mosque with, with, with my, my friends right. and family. Right. And, um, and, and how do you see that evolving? Because that's, that's such an important tradition in this nation. Well, I feel the same way, and for the last... Uh, Three Sundays, Phyllis and I have kind of gone to church through Zoom, uh, and it's not it's not even the same. I mean, it's not close to being the same thing, but, you know, we have all the other people there online with us, and it feels like we're in a worship service. It just feels like a different worship service. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know it's hard and it's challenging for people to get used to, but this is going to pass and we'll get back to some sense of normalcy. We just have to be patient and do the things we need to do and let the scientists do their work. Uh, you know, we have some research going on at Meharry about this, looking for a drug, but all over the world now, uh, scientists in a way that's never been seen before are singularly focused on this problem. And I'm confident that an answer is going to be found. Uh, we just need to do our part until that answer comes. And I think we can get through this. I really do. Well, thank you very much. For viewers who are watching right now, this is Dr. James Hildreth, president of Meharry Medical School, Medical College, and uh, I'm just so glad to have you here. You can view this episode and also uh, past episodes on Tennessean.com slash opinion. Uh, now, we're at the last couple minutes of our broadcast, uh, Dr. Hildreth, and we've, we've been recording on uh, April 16th. Would you leave us with any words of wisdom or advice as uh, we try to assess where we are and how we can get through this? I think that the pandemic, for all its negative things it does, is going to make us a better nation when we get through this. For one thing, we're going to be better prepared for the next one. There is going to be a next one. People need to know that this is going to keep happening because as human beings keep encroaching into habitats we've never been in before, we're going to get exposed to pathogens we've never been exposed to before. And when we experience a pathogen as a species that we've not seen before, it's going to race through our, our species like this one is doing. So I'm really hoping and confident that one of the things that will come out of this is that we'll be better prepared to deal with the next one, which will almost certainly come. But I do want people to know uh, and to know just, just how intensely scientists all over the world are working on this, and an answer is going to come. But let's just keep doing what we can do to protect ourselves. And by protecting ourselves, we're protecting the whole community. And that's a wonderful thing. Dr. Hilder, thank you so much again for your time. It's been a wonderful conversation for me, and I hope uh, you enjoyed it as well. And, uh, thank you. I did. And, and I'm, in, I'm inspired to read some more Shakespeare. It's been a while since I've picked up a Shakespeare book. All right, David. Thank you. Thank you.